Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Sky Sports F1 podcast with me, Matt Baker. I hope you're doing OK. To help me look back on a thrilling Singapore Grand Prix and a win for Carlos Sainz, I'm joined by, well, two ships in the night. We've got Simon coming back from Asia, from Singapore. And Anne, this Hello. evening, you're going to go out to Japan. Hello to you both. Uh, Simon, firstly, how are you? How's the jet lag? I'm all right, actually. We, uh, we, had, we pushed on through on Sunday night. So that uh, we got a ha ha, and with a knowing nod, exactly there, but that. Uh, yeah, we, I was, we were celebrating a good race, and then we got on the nine o'clock flight. Um, and uh, we, yeah, myself, Danica, and uh, one of our producers, Tommy, were heading towards the airport, and then yeah, got back late yesterday. So, all right, ship shape, ship shape. Uh, Ant, how are you looking forward to Japan? I am, Matt, yeah, again, because uh, I was there just last week uh, for the World Endurance Championship, so uh. I come back for a week and uh, back out there again today. So um, I, my body doesn't really know where it is. I've only just got over the jet lag of the time I've been talking now. And then I'm going to go and do it to myself all over again. But yeah, different locations. Well, we, we don't get the jet lag in Singapore. No, because we're well sort. We, can, we just live like vampires, as you know. So uh, it, we're, we're, we're up all night and stay on UK time. But you don't have that luxury, do you? And in Japan, you just you don't know. have it. You don't, and you've got those lovely rice pillows to look forward to as well, and rock hard bed. So yeah, it's, <laughs> it's as if the jet lag wasn't hard enough. For you yeah, it's uh, at least I fit those beds though. They're very very short beds. So yeah, I don't notice that. Unlike uh, Crofty or um, not yourself so much, Simon, but taller people of the team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Unique experience, uh, certainly, is Japan. Okay, let's uh, let's get straight into it. Our one-word race reviews from the Singapore Grand Prix. Uh, Simon, let's start with you. You were there. Go on, after you. Night fever. Oh. We'll give you that as one word, will we? Is that one word? Like night the song fever, yeah. title. Night yeah, fever. Yeah, that, yeah. That's, that's not, is it not even hyphenated, is it? Night fever. <laughs> I was Go thinking on. about that. Do you remember Henry Hope Frost? Um, well, really good guy. It was... Clear, it was um, Goodwood a couple of weeks ago, and he was known for having a fever. Um, and it was on Saturday, and it was night, and uh, that one's been. <laughs> why? Uh, why have you got night fever? Apart from obviously being at it night was and just... being feverishly exciting. Yeah, that's it. I mean, it was for 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 any motorsport fan and for a Formula One fan. Um, it was just it was good to see, wasn't it? It was refreshing to see that the Red Bull despite their amazing domination so far and it has been amazing you've got to doff your cap to what is one of the best cars possibly in the history of formula one in fact definitely in the history of formula one um 15 in a row max obviously with the record uh for consecutive wins and then it was just um an amalgamation of many things which i'm sure we'll come on to which cost them in qualifying and the race they had too much to do after qualifying on saturday and it just brought a number of teams into it. And that, that end that we had, the last 17 laps, it was out, it was outstanding. It was the best race of the year. I don't think anybody could deny that. And everyone was on the edge of their seats after that late virtual safety car and Mercedes kind of taking the chance to, to go for those two sets of new mediums, which they'd held back exactly for a situation like that. Mm. A glimpse, isn't it, into what would have happened perhaps this season if Red Bull hadn't have been so far ahead. And... Can you beat night fever? And I bet you can, because you'll probably pick one word, which was within the rules. It was be one word. Uh, Simon already stole another one during during that uh, and that chat there. Um, <laughs> I was going to say refreshing. It was refreshing to see uh, a different winner. Red Bull not in the mix, right at the sharp end. And it kind of justified everything that we had been saying all along. Uh, you know, not so much take Red Bull out of it, out of the equation, but you take Max Verstappen out of the equation, and suddenly you've got a mega race on your hands, and that's what we've been seeing from second place down pretty much all the way through this season. I would say it was different, it was strategic, tactical, it had a mix of everything. Um, the only thing, uh, the only thing at the end, uh, it was just a shame that it was just a shame in a way that. I think everyone was behind Mercedes in a way. Like you want the you want the underdog to kind of come through, and they had they played a blinder with a virtual safety car, boxing both cars. Ferrari had left Leclerc out there to do the the defensive work, get his elbows out, but that didn't last long. And they were just on this surge to the front, and it was just we could all see what was coming. We were watching the the lap times coming down and. 
purple sectors flying from both drivers and uh, you're just waiting, waiting for it to just, yeah, get right to the front. And then it kind of, it didn't quite happen, but um, it, it was brilliant nonetheless. Absolutely brilliant. Remarkable, um, remarkable race. I've gone for wise, actually. And I've gone for wise because of Carlos at the front. I thought he was incredible. The way he bought Lando in with within DRS to give him an extra tool against the the or tool in defense against the Mercedes I thought was was remarkable really um and and yeah I just I mean obviously and you know this very well but how drivers are able to process so much information think strategically while also driving a car around a track like Singapore where the where the walls are so tight I, I just I can barely do one thing at once, let alone what the drivers are doing. I think it's absolutely remarkable. So yeah, I yeah, don't know. It, it really was. I mean, another one word for you that I, I kind of toyed with using earlier on: symbiotic, because that's exactly uh, yeah. yeah, that's exactly what does they, that mean, Ant? Oh, what does that mean? <laughs> it was the relationship usually between d two different organisms uh, helping each yep. other out in some way, and that's exactly what the Ferrari and the McLaren were doing of Lando Norris and Carlos Sainz towards the end of the race. It was very symbiotic. Symbiosis in full flow, that was, because Carlos knew he needed Lando there to help defend him by him having DRS. So, and Lando was protected by Carlos by giving him DRS. So it was, a, it was this two-way relationship that beautifully worked. The two of them are obviously very good friends. They, they maybe can read each other's minds as well. They've grown up racing against each other. And it was, honestly, it was amazing to watch because it was subtle, but Carlos, he, he played it brilliantly. And as a driver myself looking on, I could see exactly what he was doing. And I was incredibly envious as well at the same time, because that was, it was very hard to execute. Uh, and that's exactly what he did. He, he, there was even a moment when uh, Lando and George were fighting each other down towards turn 16 and he, Lando had lost quite a bit of ground to Carlos and before the final corner came up to 18-19 uh, the gap had risen to over one second and I thought this is going to be George's chance now down towards turn 7 he'll be in the DRS but Carlos had spotted it slowed down intentionally through the final corner and the first sequence of corners to make sure his buddy was right there behind him once again down the back straight towards turn seven had the drs so he was even the team didn't know what carlos was up to he said leave it to me <laughs> i know what i'm doing here you're probably not going to understand right now and i haven't got the time to explain but watch this it was it was awesome absolutely awesome he he utterly deserved that victory and actually, you could say, couldn't you, and that the the symbiosis extended to his to his teammate Charles because he yeah. he was prepared to act as his rear gunner, particularly as he got ahead on the softs at the start, and you got two Ferraris at the front. When he got ahead of Chivas, they were able to they were able to kind of run at their own pace, manage their tires. And when they came in after the first safety car, they double stacked. Uh, you know, Charles had to have the five and a half second pit stop, which which hurt him a little bit, but. Yeah, even after the race, I was quite surprised that Charles said, look, we did the job we needed to do tonight. It didn't work out for me, but it worked out for the team. And, and Carlos deserves it after the way he's been driving. I think in, a Ferrari, uh, in his Ferrari overalls, this is probably as good a run as he's had since the, the summer break. He's just totally on it. And it feels to me like he's added Saturday single lap qualifying pace to... To his armory, which was his his weakness. I think it's something like eight seven now to Charles on on a Saturday, but he's no pushover. That is, as we we're talking about after the race with everybody, it's not a one two driver line up there. It's two world class drivers, and they're they're working together and driving the team forward. And Ferrari executed very well, and I think that would have been one of the biggest question marks. Yes, a lot was down to the driver, but overall as a team, they had a good weekend. I think. Yeah, they really do. Mm. I mean, Ferrari have come under the spotlight numerous times in recent years, of, you know, not getting their strategy completely right, uh, not optimizing their car, the two drivers, sometimes not even really seeing eye to eye and not working well together. But that race, everything came together. Uh, there'll be some people questioning why they didn't pit Leclerc under the virtual safety car, because that would have that would have helped his race. He was falling personally. He was falling back from Carlos. Uh, and that would have definitely helped Charles' race. 
Well, they say, Simon, playing the team game, the team looking at it strategically, they knew they needed to use Charles. And, you know, I know the Mercedes didn't spend long behind him, but every little helped in that situation to try to further hurt the Mercedes fresh medium tyres in their quest to try and get back to the front. So, yeah, they used him wisely. He understood the game. He backed off when he needed to at the start of the race to give that three or four second gap that the team were looking for. Uh, I think it took a little while to sink in for Charles, but then he realized quite quickly that that was going to help protect the lead of the race for Ferrari from a potential undercut of Mercedes. So, or, or McLaren. So, but together they just worked brilliantly well to make sure that they had covered their backs and also push when they needed to. And Carlos knew he had the speed. Uh, we saw it all weekend. He, he knew he had the speed to match Mercedes or even better them and that of McLaren as well. And that's why he was comfortable at the end of the race to, to do what he did. He knew on the, on the equal tires, he, he had the measure of Lando. It was, it was, you know, the Mercedes that were the threat. So yeah, it was, it was a strategic race. And I think you can, you, you can definitely um, applaud Ferrari this time without question for, for how they played it. Strategic, yes. And sometimes we, strategic races can be guilty of not being overly exciting this, or the spectacle of it not being as good. Whereas I think no one is in any, any doubt that the spectacle of this race was phenomenal, certainly those last, those last laps. Uh, Simon, I, I, I want to just chat to you about um, Science versus Leclerc. You alluded to it there that they're now quite evenly matched. And if we look at the points, we've got Science on 142 points in the, in the Drivers' Championship, Leclerc on 123. Do you think now, or would you say this was the weekend or this, this period since the summer break is where Ferrari now do officially have two... I mean, there's been no doubt that Carlos Sainz has been a world-class driver, but they've got two excellent drivers who are ready. And if they get given the car next year, will both be in contention for a world world championship. Yeah, yeah I, absolutely. I don't, I don't think you can... There's no doubt about either driver. Well, there's, there's, there were small doubts about either driver. I've always said this to Han, and, I, and I, he knows what I feel with, with Charles. I always think he kind of... He's guilty of making a few too many mistakes. Uh and I think he's he's ironing that out. He's still probably the quicker of the two drivers. In fact, definitely the quicker of the two drivers o over one lap. But when it comes to the race itself, Carlos Sainz is, as I always say, he's from racing royalty. You know, his dad, very cerebral driver. He's the same. They, they, they think their way through things. And as going back to what you were saying about wise and the intelligence that Carlos possesses, I'd say he's one of the most intelligent drivers and he uses it every single Sunday, right? He, he might not have had the podiums uh, this year, but he's always there or thereabouts. He's always been fourth or fifth. He always maximizes what that car can do. So if he's given a race winning car, if he's given a car that can challenge Red Bull over a, the course of a season, I think there's a very strong case to say that, you know, that pairing is stronger than the Red Bull lineup. Um, I'd say that that is on a par potentially perhaps not quite as good as the Mercedes pairing, which I'd still still say is, is number one. But I, I don't know if Ant agrees, but as you said, two world-class drivers, given the car, they'll turn it into wins. Yeah, I mean, Carlos has definitely proven in the, the last two Grand Prix that his defensive skills are... I, I, I think they're the best out there. I really do. He, he's so wise in where he places the car. He can understand the what's going on behind him so well uh you know he kept his teammate at bay in monza he fought incredibly hard with max who's you know it's no mean feat to try and keep him behind you and he's willing to take a good amount of risk as well but it's a calculated risk with carlos he's a very classy driver and i mean he he can still work on a little bit of that speed on more uh, higher speed faster flowing circuits street tracks are very different you often see different drivers come to the fore for whatever reason uh, at street tracks. You know, we've seen Lewis Hamilton get beaten at Monaco in the past from the likes of uh, Valtteri Bottas, uh, Nico Rosberg. And we've seen Max get beaten in the past by Daniel Ricciardo in Monaco. And Singapore is, hasn't really been a, a, an incredibly strong track for Max. And different drivers seem to excel at these street tracks. And I think Carlos is one of those drivers that, for whatever reason, can get a bit more out of it uh, than, than some. So, 
you know, yes, Monza was a great weekend for him. Singapore's obviously been fantastic for him as well. But I want to see that level of performance roll on into Suzuka because that's that's a more traditional kind of circuit where you would naturally expect a Leclerc to get the better of Carlos. So I'm, I'm waiting to see that the, this weekend come in. Yeah, we're waiting to see a lot of things at Suzuka, mainly about the Red Bulls as well. We'll come on to that. Uh, just sort of finally on the, on the Ferrari story uh, and Ant, what, what, we've obviously spoken about the drivers and where the speed has come in terms of Carlos and, and, and Charles stepping up. But what about the car? Because it seems like since, well, the last two races, Monza and, 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 and Singapore, the cars looked great. I mean, wh- where's this change come from? Well, I mean, the teams are constantly updating their cars as well, don't forget. So, I mean, I, I think this year has been more so than last year even. Uh, now they're fully understanding these cars and where the performance comes from. They attack this season pretty aggressively with their updates. And we've seen so like, the likes of McLaren. They've surged forward this year. Ferrari have made good updates as well. Mercedes, uh, Red Bull have stayed constantly up there, of course. But um, Aston Martin are the team that haven't quite kept up with the pack. And it's very easy when everybody's making those updates constantly through the year. It's very easy just to think, well, nobody's really brought anything to the table. It's it's pretty much a stalemate, but Aston Martin have lost out. But it's far from that. Um, I know from, I mean, I don't want to give too much away, but just from my experience in the simulator, I've seen the car improve. Uh, taking it back to different circuits uh, that were earlier in the year on, say, the current aero configuration, you see that you see that relentless improvement through the season, and everybody's doing that. So if you do stay still, you will fall behind the pack. So Ferrari are definitely one of those teams that have kept up with the pack. Maybe their updates have edged ahead of teams like Aston Martin that we're seeing uh, recently in the last couple of races, but. Again, two very different circuits, Matt. You know, Monza, people think of it as this high-speed circuit. It is, because it's got lots of straight lines, but it hasn't got many high-speed corners and you don't run a high downforce there. So it's all about the braking and the slow-speed corners, just like Singapore. You wouldn't think the two really are on the same plane here. And in terms of downforce, no. But in terms of car requirement... Braking stability, slow speed corners, lots of traction. That's what you need at Monza as well. So the Ferrari's been quite good on those circuits all season. Not Montreal as well, another one more similar to, to uh, Monza. High speed straights, long braking zones, slow speed corners, lots of traction. That seems to be where their car shines. So in the same way, I'm saying I'm waiting to see whether Carlos can match Charles in Suzuka. I'm waiting to see whether Ferrari can carry on this pace when they get to a higher speed, faster flowing circuit. It's going to be very, very interesting uh, in Suzuka. Simon, let's 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 move on to Red Bull. And this this was a weekend in which, certainly from my perspective, not being there, it, it felt like Red Bull were on the ropes a little bit all weekend. And we've seen, haven't we, throughout the season, we see Max on a Friday perhaps be uh, you know uh, frustrated or annoyed with the way the car's set up. But li- but by Saturday, by quality generally all those problems seem to have eradicated themselves. That's been the trend across the season so far. This weekend in Singapore, that wasn't the case. And he was having problems, wasn't he? All throughout the Saturday and into Sunday. What's your take on on what went wrong for Red Bull this, this weekend? Uh, the lizard put a curse on him. <laughs> I think... I think that's, that's, that's where it all started, wasn't it? He saw Son of Godzilla, Baby Godzilla. It was haunting for him, and it all went backwards from there. At least that's one explanation you could say. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. the baseline setup wasn't right, was it, from the start? So they were playing catch-up. Um, you know, he, he didn't seem to have any confidence in the first sector. He was bottoming out under braking, which was, uh, going back to what, what Alan was saying, it's all about braking, it's all about traction out the sh- slow corners. They had neither of those. And I think with regards to the car itself, we know that as an aero platform, it tends to work on most circuits now, medium speed corners, high speed corners. But the slow speed corners combined, I think, with the bumpy nature of the track and the fact that there were such big curbs meant that they had to adjust the ride height. And in adjusting the ride height, it kind of threw the setup off a little bit. They tried 
some tweaks between the third practice session and, and qualifying with the software to try to, to counter that so they could run it a bit lower. And it just got worse, didn't it, Ant? So it, you know, I think it was just a combination of things. There's been talk about whether the TDs on the flexi front wings and the underside of the car had played anything uh, into this, but I'm not sure that's the case. Maybe that's a red herring, but we'll find out, won't we, in Suzuka? So um, Christian was playing it down. The team was saying, look, it's absolutely nothing to do with that. It is just, we've got an unbalanced car. We can't get the setup right. And I, I think... It got slightly better in the race. They got unlucky, didn't they? They were they were holding out for the, the safety car came too early for them, really, because they both started on the on the sets of hards, and then they pitted, and then what was it? Three laps later, the virtual safety car came out. So, timing wise, they got a little bit unlucky in the race. They knew what they were trying to do, but ultimately, it all stems from the fact that they didn't get quality right, and that's back to back years now where it's not paid off for Max Verstappen, and he was saying, "Look, it's totally unacceptable." This this car, you cannot drive it. Um, and it looked like it was just like skating across the track at times. So I, I I thought for for then, it was a horrible weekend. But for everybody watching from the neutrals perspective, it, it kind of, it was, it just was a breath of fresh air for, for the competition. We needed that weekend. We needed to see that there was a, a chink in the armour. And obviously, Red Bull being Red Bull will go away and work on that and clearly improve the car for next year. So it kind of, you know, it's, it's double-edged sword. We got them, you know, Ferrari think we got them this, this year in Singapore, but they'll get it right. That car has got very, very few weaknesses. Yeah, I mean, it's, Red Bull, it's an interesting one, isn't it? it? It reminds me of when Mercedes were in their dominant years and they arrived at Singapore and that was their Achilles heel and everybody else had a chance to get the better of them there. And they went away and worked on that circuit uh, relentlessly because it was their only weakness. They understood they had a weakness there. And then they came back and they, in a couple of years, they had sorted it out. So I fully expect Red Bull, the great engineering team that they are, will get their heads around it and, uh, and, and, and kind of engineer that into next year's car, the RB20. But um, I also think it's, it's not a circuit that, that Max particularly enjoys so much. Uh, you know, beaten by Perez there last year and, you know, the, the way the strategy unfolded and everything kind of went against him as well. But I, Max will be much more in his element and the car will be much more in his element in Suzuka. I'm fully expecting that. I don't think this new um, TD, uh, the, the rule change in terms of the more static front wings not allowing them to flex quite as much and the floor, I, I don't believe, I don't believe that was the, the, main issue for Red Bull in Singapore. I think it requires a lot more mechanical compliance and agility from the car at that circuit, not just downforce. So obviously downforce helps you everywhere. As I say, as a driver, downforce is your friend, uh, but you know, whatever speed, that's why we run higher downforce at circuits like Monaco and Singapore, because it does work at slow speed as well, not just a high speed. But it has less of an influence in the in the slow speed compared to the high speed. So I don't think it was all to do with with that. There'll be many teams out there crossing their fingers and hoping that that is uh, that, that that's why they they lost their speed there. But I'm fully expecting them to go back to to Suzuka and uh, and the car will be flying again. But it is interesting and it's nice to know that they that they have these uh, the, the this weakness in their car. What I was hoping for you to say that, Ant, is that there is some hope and that maybe when we get to Suzuka, Red Bull might not look as good as they did. Maybe that will be the case. You know, maybe it will hinder hinder them a bit. I mean, there are rumours going around. I'm not suggesting for a second that this is Red Bull, but there are rumours going around that teams were using the uh, the titanium skid blocks in the underfloor of the car in a way that would, I, I don't know the exact technicalities to it, but would move and allow the teams to run their cars lower. And as we know, in this ground effect era, if you can run the floor closer to the ground, uh, you're going to get a bit more suction. The car will have effectively more downforce and happy days because you're not, it's not a drag penalty by gaining downforce from the floor of the car as much as you would from a, from a wing. So yeah, yeah. If, you know, if, if things like this are going on with different teams up and down the field, it must be a little bit of a negative impact, but you know, like I say, not suggesting. I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. It's all I've heard. I've, I've read it in the, I've read it in the you know, online as well. 
And, you know, these rumours are out there. They don't come from, from thin air. So, and, and the regulation wouldn't have changed if the FIA didn't feel like this was going on. Yeah. So, I believe, you know, it has been going on. They're clamping down on it. And yeah, let, let's see if there are any, any shakeups. But I, I don't think it's going to really affect Red Bull's stranglehold on the competition in those high speed circuits. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Simon, I want to I just move on and talk about the, um, Christian Horner really this weekend because it, it was the first weekend, like I said, that Red Bull looked uncomfortable. We know obviously he was fielding a lot of questions at the start of the weekend on the, on the Helmut Marco comments. And then as the weekend progressed, he was obviously fielding a lot of questions from the media on, on the lack of performance and the lack of improvement in performance in the Red Bull. How, how did he, or how was he this weekend? I mean, you must have interviewed him a, few, a fair few times throughout the weekend. How did it, how did it change? And, and, and how has it changed from, say, early on in the season when obviously everything's going well? I guess this is where you earn your money, isn't it, as a team principal, when the chips are down and when you've got to come out and yeah. face the media? Yeah, I think it's not like you're responsible for a squad of... 24 players like you might be in a Premier League football team you're responsible for a squad and a team of up to a thousand maybe more than a thousand people in the case of some of the bigger teams so I think as a team principal you have to wear a number of hats I think Christian is actually pretty good at it I, I think you know there's a reason that he's the longest serving team principal there's a reason that he's like the second youngest team principal I think he's second only to it's Colin Chapman, isn't it? And there's a reason that he got that that early. He is driven. He is focused. He is an absolute competitor. And I think over the last few years, they've been used to a lot of criticism coming towards them uh, for, for the, the right and the wrong reasons. But whatever the reasons are, you have to be the judge of those yourself. But they've certainly, and Christian particularly, has had to field a lot of negativity. Um, so I, I think he had to do that at the beginning of the weekend because Dr. Marco's comments were, were unacceptable. Um, he did, when we interviewed him, say, I asked him about, you know, why there wasn't a statement released by the team. And he said that is because he's an employee of the, the wider Red Bull group. Um, when you look on the company's house website, he is one of only two active directors of Red Bull Racing. So you could say there was a, an element of, of spin there. Dr. Marco apologised. Sergio Perez accepted it. Um, was that enough? What would it have cost them, I think, the team to put out a statement saying it's just not good enough? But, uh, you know, according to the team, they did that via service TV from the wider group, and that's, that's where they drew a line underneath it. So, number one, he had to deal with that. And number two, he had a struggling car and two very frustrated drivers all weekend. Um, but I think there's an acceptance that they're just so far ahead, right? The, the championships, both of the championships are theirs. It's not a question of, of uh, if, but when. So I think they've got that leeway that he's able to take it on the chin and say, okay, we'll learn from this, we'll move on. Uh, I, I think he does it very well. I, I, you know, I, I, I think that team occasionally, I would say, is a, a very unforgiving environment. The pressure that goes on to the drivers. Um, I'm just looking at what Liam Lawson's going on, going through at the moment. But certainly, you know, there is absolutely no room for error, and that it's a highly, highly pressurised team and environment that perhaps differs to some of the other ones. Um, I'm thinking of, you know, just some of the bigger teams. It's definitely a different way to go racing. It's their own way, Red Bull's way. So I think he handled it as best he could. Horrible weekend. Um, came out, faced the music like they all did. I think they just were like, right, okay, bad weekend, move on. We'll be good for Suzuka. And to be to be fair, when when you, it's likely they're going to win the constructors championship in Suzuka, and it's like it was exceptionally likely that Max is going to win the the drivers championship in Qatar. So I guess that will help them move forward and move on very very quickly. Um, okay, I want to sort of honourable mentions to to some other people within the field. And George, George Russell, I think we need to give a give a shout out and a commiserations to George. He obviously crashed out in that final lap. Um, and I think it just goes just goes to show the fine margins involved in this sport. You know that one lapse in concentration, if that's what it was, or just that you know millimeters, and he's into the wall, and he loses all the points. And and I don't know if you've ever had any sort of similar experience, but you you know particularly in Singapore, particularly with the physical demands, particularly with the mental demands of that track, after sixty two laps, 
you then you then crash out and put it in the wall and lose all the points that you, you gather for the team. I mean, that must just make you feel sick, mustn't it? Uh, it's one that every, every driver's been through in their career, Matt, whether it is in your junior career or you know when it's in the limelight and spotlight of Formula One the world watching over you, uh, let alone for the, the lead of the race or potential lead of the race like it was for George. So you've been that hero for so many laps in the race and you just you feel like you can walk on water and then and then suddenly mm. reality hits you very hard in the face and yeah he'll pick himself up he he definitely will he's he's young he knows he's got the talent he knows the team are right behind him but it's embarrassing as he said himself you know it's a, a very elementary mistake silly mistake and it is not like it's not like it happens through a corner and he just lost the car and uh, or understeered wide is just placing off the car before you turn in and it I've seen it happen so many times you know people just dip in a wheel like, like Sergio Perez in first practice first lap in Budapest on his outlet dips a wheel on the grass and spins off and goes into the barrier it, it, you know they've all they've all done it it, it happens to to the best of them mm. um yeah he's just got to pick himself up but it's going to hurt for a couple of days what was he was he thrown though? I mean, the question because Lando hit the wall as well. Lando hit turn ten. He, he glanced it, and I wonder if he's kind of like you're hypnotized, aren't you? You're, you're following him so closely. He's trying absolutely everything he can to you know to to get on his tail and, and make the miracle move. But he's so close, he just he misjudged it by a fraction of an inch and hit it slightly harder than than Lando's kiss, and that's that's kind of what. What did it for him? But it, I mean, he looked, yeah, I mean, he called it pathetic, didn't he? Once all the dust had settled, once he'd got through the emotion of it all, which must have been absolutely coursing through his veins for about an hour. Yeah. I think by the time he'd got through all the TV interviews, it kind of started to settle that, you know, that's another one that got away. And you could tell from his radio comments that he thought, this is one we could win. And he said it in the, the press conference after qualifying, he said, you know, we're the only ones realistically that could physically do a one or a two stop dependent on the safety car coming out because they had that extra set of mediums. And it, it worked out almost perfectly that they were able to get those and strap on the new mediums and just throw caution to the wind and attack, attack, attack. But once he didn't get the pass on Lando done early, I think it was game over for him. And then he was you know, he was gambling a little bit and, and and therefore made the mistake right at the end. So, um, yeah, shame for George, but, you know, he, he'll bounce back. He's going to win a load more Grand Prix in, in, in his, it, in his it career, was such, no doubt about the it. Thing I, the thing I, I love him for and the team for is that they tried. It would have been so easy just to sit there in second place, like Lando did. Yeah. He would have picked up a nice shiny trophy with P2 written on it. And yeah, it would have been good. The team would have scored loads of points and uh, and it would have been quite a boring race, actually, towards the end, watching four cars trundle around behind the Ferrari and after its tyres, everybody else on the same same set. It could have been a really boring end to the Grand Prix if you think about it like that. But George wasn't willing to accept that and neither was Lewis and neither were the team. And I really loved them for the fact that they saw a bit of an opportunity driven, you know, pushed by George the whole race. What can we do to win this? I want to win this. I don't want to finish second. I want to win this. I can't overtake him on track. We have to think outside the box. And them doing what they... They made it a race. They they all... Mercedes and their drivers made that Grand Prix a fantastic Grand Prix and one that was nail biting get through to the end. And I don't, I don't really... I don't care that George ended up in the barrier because he showed fighting spirit and determination um, and a will to win. And that it was, it was, I win this race or nothing for him. And, and that was, I, I, I just, you know, in a, in a year where you're not going to win the world championship, it's Red Bulls, it's Max's. Why not? Just let's turn it into a motor race. And that's exactly what it was to it is. I, I, yeah, I, I would like to think that I would have done the same thing if, if I was in that situation. I just go for it. What have you got to lose? We all owe uh, the Mercedes team then a, a debt of gratitude to, to make it such an interesting race a race at the end. A um, couple of other stories. The, the Lando, uh, Lando obviously finished second, but I also want to bunch this in with, the, with a chat about Aston Martin as well, because McLaren are closing in on fourth place. They have 78 points behind Aston Martin. And I think what's interesting here is 
we talk about how McLaren now, with the with the upgrades, have got two drivers who can score points consistently over a weekend. Oscar Piastri and Lando Norris are generally there or thereabouts since since the summer you know going to be going to be scoring points on the Aston side yes you've got Fernando Alonso no one's doubting his his abilities and his ability to score points but Lance Stroll I've got down here he's had one point in the last five races and they do not have as things stand two drivers in that team that can score points consistently so Simon I I wonder what you made of Mike Crack's comments he he said after after Stroll's crashing quality, it was a big hit. I Meant he wasn't wasn't in the race on, on Sunday. He said it's proof that he's in. I think this is another proof that he fully has it. He tried to make it a positive, spin it so that it looked like yeah he's committed. Do you agree? Do do you think that that's that that's maybe a bit of a PR line from Aston, or do you, or do you think Lance is is genuinely struggling in that car? Um, well, first of all. It, it we're all glad he's all right because that was that was a big one i think martin mm, in his mm. column on monday morning said you know you wouldn't have survived that in his time perhaps in the you know 80s 90s whatever before all of the safety um changes you know became standard that would have been a very very nasty shunt it still was a nasty shunt and i think a combination of that and a hugely expensive and extensive rebuild of the car meant that they just thought, right, let's take the decision, pause, get him right, get him back for Suzuka so that we can, um, you know, so that we can get there and just wash our hands of this weekend because it didn't work out for Fernando Alonso either. He had that long pit stop. We're talking about the gambling, you know, 25 seconds, he was stuck there. He got the five-second penalty for crossing the pit line, pit lane entry line. So all in all, that was a horror weekend for, for them, bearing in mind that they'd earmark this one as a very... Um, a very good opportunity to at least get a podium and potentially for Fernando to have pushed for the win. But they didn't look like they they were on it from the start of the weekend, really. So for Lance, look, you're benchmarking yourself against, to me, one of the top three drivers on, on the grid and, you know, quite possibly on a par with with, with Lewis and, 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 and Max because Fernando Alonso is that good. So you're always having... To, to compare yourself to that. And that is, that is hard because he's not at that standard. He he very much is not Fernando Alonso. It's very unlikely that, that Lance Stroll will become Fernando Alonso in the future. So where's his head at after that? I, I, he was able to be you know reasonably competitive against Sebastian Vettel towards the end of Sebastian Vettel's career. But he has been blown away this year. He's been unfortunate. He had obviously the pre-season accident, um, which he you know came back strongly from. But... He's not on that level, and if he was closer, they would be challenging for second, and they wouldn't be now trying to hold their own for fourth. So they've got an issue, um, and I'm fascinated with his father only seeing to see how how it pans out because I wonder if it's you know if it's a case of you know is his heart in it, is his head in it? Um, I hope for his sake it is, and that he bump you know bounces back in Suzuka. But only time will tell on that one. It's um, it's one of the the great kind of quandaries at the moment. I think in in Formula One, what what goes on there? Mm. Very unique to Formula One as well. Not many sports have your father owning a team and your son driving for that team. It was very unlikely to happen in football, and I mean, yeah, other 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 team sports. I can't really imagine that happening. Um, or if it did, that would be quite kind of kind of amazing. Uh, okay, one one other story I just want to wrap up before before we move on to Japan, and that's the Liam Lawson story. We we mentioned him earlier. Incredible performance from, from him. It was his first points in Formula One. Finished P nine. He also knocked Verstappen out of out of Q two. Uh, which meant he could proceed into Q3. And what what do you where do you see his future? Because I'm seeing reports on Twitter that, that you know stuff is fl- is whirring around that obviously Yuki Tsunoda is going to be announced for Alpha Tauri for next year. So that leaves one remaining seat, which might well be Daniel Ricciardo. So what 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 more could Liam Lawson have done, and what more could he do in 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 Japan to ensure he's on the grid for 2024? Well, I had a, a brilliant saying uh, during my time as a driver, Matt, when they... Actually, it was Gilles Deferrin. It came from him. And, uh, you know, I was asking him at the time, what, what do you think I should do when I was a test driver? What, what do you think I can do? You know, is there a chance? How do I propel myself from being a test driver onto the grid? He said, it's simple, and Just you take care of the present and the future takes care of itself. And I thought, it's, I never forgot that. So that is a brilliant <laughs> line. It's yeah, so true. Lovely. And that's all that... 
Liam can do. And, and so far, he is. He's, he's really performing well. I've been super impressed with what I'm seeing so far uh, out of the, the last three Grand Prix. Two of them have been incredibly tough. I mean, Zanfor, with those mixed conditions, thrown in at the deep end with, with no testing, hardly knew the car at all. I think he'd only done one, one filming day in it or something like that around, around the short circuit at Silverstone. So he's thrown at the deep end in Zanfor. What a Grand Prix to try and survive. He did, did really well made a brilliant plucky move down the inside of a formidable Charles Leclerc into the turn 11 chicane precise you know excellent showcase of his ability and determination and then Monza of course you know another another good weekend uh, but an easier circuit I must say one that any rookie would choose I think looking back at Nick de Vries uh, from last year any any mm. driver would choose Monza as a circuit to have their first go at or you know uh, an early time behind the wheel and then this incredibly hard weekend at Singapore as well I mean what a track to 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 try and drive your fastest around in a car you barely know in those tough conditions and my goodness he did a great job there like like you said Matt in qualifying pipping Max Verstappen knocking him out i mean that's <laughs> maybe he uh sealed the nail in the coffin at that moment with ever getting a drive for the yeah anything. right <laughs> <laughs> it did cross my mind <laughs> oops sorry about that guys yeah but you know, yeah. he's out there for himself and i think he should be out there for himself he if the red bull deal doesn't work out for him i know they've nurtured his way and they've paid his way to to come about you know for this opportunity to come about but in the same way that we've seen Pierre Gasly make his own bed somewhere else, if he has to do that, and and I don't know how their contracts work there, maybe take a financial hit as well, because I'm sure they sign up for a long time with the Red Bull program, uh, so be it. He was annoyed with himself when he stopped by uh, to talk to us afterwards because of his start. <laughs> he was like, he'd, he'd achieved that, he'd, he'd, you know, he'd got into the points, uh, they've had four drivers there and only Yuki scored points alongside him and only one point more than him so he, he can't I'm with Ant can't have done any more I think what they might do is if they are going to announce Yuki for another year and the likelihood is that they trust Daniel Ricciardo to come back and, and give him the spot that they'd kind of held out to give him then what do you do with him so if you look with Alex Albon you know maybe they'll send him out on a you know, a piece of elastic somewhere else that they can come back. And we were talking about it and Karuna and I were chatting about it. You know, I think one of the likely places for him to end up is Williams. I think mm. he's the kind of guy that's made such an impression that, you know, as my wife comes through the door, there we go. Oh God, interrupting the podcast. They are just gone for a morning <laughs> coffee. Um, anyway, let me, let me continue with my train of thought. Hold on. What are we talking about? Oh yeah. Liam Lawson. <laughs> So yeah, he yeah. I, I just think that Williams would be a good fit for him. Imagine that as a combination: Alex Albon and Liam Lawson. And he's got a really good head on his young shoulders. And I'm with Ant. I think he's exactly like Piastri. I think they've come in and they seem. Let's go back to wise, wise beyond their their years. Um, so I think that uh, I think that would be a good option. I wonder if it is an option or whether they just. Hold him back as a reserve driver for next year, and then slip him in when when they have the opportunity. But right now, I think he's the kind of kind of guy that is a breath of fresh air, and we need more of that next generation because he he seems like he's to the manner born. I reckon, I really do. I think what what will be interesting as well is is what happens with Logan Sargent, and I think it just. It, it, it's tough to say, but you can be a rookie. You can come into a car and you can look really, really good. I think we've seen that with Oscar Piastri. We've seen what Liam Lawson's done there. And, and I do wonder if, if perhaps you might see James Vowles looking at what someone like Lawson has done and go, actually, is 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 Logan Sargent our driver for 2024? But I'm sure time will tell as to, as to what happens what happens with that. If you're Red Bull and you're looking at it, look, you've got potential hot property here in Liam Lawson. You, you you have to nurture the young talent and finding time behind the wheel is pretty tough these days. You've got Daniel Ricciardo still there. Once he's fit, he'll be back in the car, of course, and Lawson will go back to his super formula. Or will he? Do you really want him to be doing that? Or do you want him to continue to hone his skills in Formula One? It's probably a better option. I, I would be wanting that. If I was team owner at Red Bull, I'd be thinking, he's done well so far. And he's done this with such limited experience. 
where's where's the limit for this kid? Uh, I want to see that. I want to put him, you know, still out of the spotlight, relatively speaking, potentially in the Williams. They get a good driver from it, and we get our talent to continue learning his skills. Uh, and against a formidable driver like Alex Albon, uh, in a nice environment, and yeah, go and go and learn there. And then when we think you're ready or there's a space for you, we'll definitely have you back. And then you're going to be closer mm. to the finished article. Feels like the right mm. step, doesn't it, for both the driver and for the Williams team. And and Vals, he said that, didn't he, when he came into into uh, after Monza, he just said, "Look, I've said to Logan, it's in your hands. You've got the next few races to 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 prove whether you can pick up the points." And um, at the moment, he's not. You see the opportunity to get somebody like Liam Lawson. You go right, okay. That for the team, you know, that's a really potentially very good lineup, and uh, and one that they've not had for a few years. And with Alex pulling them in the right direction, if they've got a second driver that can help him do that, then all of a sudden these uh, the green shoots of recovery at Williams are are growing into smaller plants and you know taking hold and. And that's exactly what he's wanted to do, James. And uh, it, it feels like at last Williams are a team moving in the right direction. So I, I wonder if that will motivate them for for his um, his his signature, if they can get if mm. they can get it. Time will tell. Uh, final final couple of things just just before we say goodbye. Um, Japan, and you're obviously going out there th th this uh, this evening, rather I should say. Um, what are your expectations? I know, I know. In terms of we've we've spoken about the Red Bull and we've spoken about what we think that perhaps they they might be back with with a vengeance. But what, yeah, what what are, what are your expectations for that? And, and who do you think is going to be looking good around Suzuka? Well, I I think that Red Bull will will surge back to the front. Uh, I I think you know they'll be the team to beat. It's a circuit I think will really play to the strength of their car. Max flies around that circuit as well. It's one that he loves. Uh, so th they'll be the ones ones to game with the target on their back, uh, with with the rest of the pack trying to catch them. Um, I'm I'm sure it'll be, uh, you know, a, a much more plain sailing weekend as far as Red Bull go. After that, I think it can be, it's going to be quite tight. I'm I'm intrigued to see whether Ferrari can keep this pace up. My gut instinct is that they won't. I feel like it'll be more Mercedes and McLaren that kind of are picking up the pieces. And don't forget that we'll have Oscar Piastri on the updates as well that he didn't have in Singapore. So he'll be closer, should be closer to the to Lando's performance uh, at, that, at that track. And I really expect a really close fight. That, that battle from Singapore will continue between McLaren and, and Mercedes. Uh, will Aston Martin be better? Uh, I feel like they've been slightly left behind in recent races, the the updates uh, haven't really been working out for them. Other people have have leaped in front of them in the development race, leapt in front of them, I should say. Uh, and yeah, I, I think it will be Ferrari somewhere close to Mercedes and McLaren. But this time, I think it will be, I think it'll be McLaren and Mercedes, whichever order, in front of the Ferrari come the end of the the race on Sunday. Very interesting, Simon. You'll be you'll be up, will you, at one a.m. For oh, FP1 yeah. oh, for, yeah. from home. What we? Yeah, yeah. yeah I would, of course I will. Of course I will. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. To, to be honest, uh, you know, it, Japan is just such a great circuit, isn't it? You just you you, you want to get up to witness cars going around Suzuka, you know, taking the S's and you know, one eighty R and all that kind of stuff. It's just it's it is an amazing track and it's a chassis track. So I'm with Anne, right? It's 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 effectively. It's going to be Red Bull again, unless unless something stratospheric happens. It's going to, it's going to be Red Bull, but I just fancy. I think McLaren are the team that are just doing this with the upgrades this year. They they are they've sorted out one of their Achilles heels, which was the low speed corners. It seems on on Lando's car that update worked really well for them. Um, but just look at how we went at Silverson. You, you know that it's uh, it's it's a becoming a good car at most circuits now and I think if you had to pick one team that have developed best over the year it's obviously McLaren and and you can see that in the results and how they've got better so yeah um 
yeah, bring it on. Can't wait. <laughs> we'll be from my sofa and not yes. from that the tiny hotel rooms that Ant's got to get into with the the, the <laughs> no, rice pillows. As Crofty me. always said, as Crofty always says, you just pour some hot water on the rice pillows and it fluffs them up, and makes them more comfortable. <laughs> so remember that tip, yeah. We're going to leave it there, Simon and thank you very much and sleep well. Try to <laughs> on your give my regards yeah, to Yokaichi. Oh, we'll do Simon, yeah, and and sushi as well. I know you love. You'll be missing yeah. out. We, we do. Oh, no. Oh, who are they? Go on, explain nice... who they are. No. What's that? Explain who. Is it a person or is it a place? Who? Yokaichi or sushi? Yeah. Sushi's a food, Matt. And uh, Yokaichi, <laughs> is, Yokaichi is the place we stay in. But we're just outside Yokaichi. Um, and if you're not a sushi fan, a Domino's has recently opened up there and, and, a, and a McDonald's. But that's brand placement. Can't do that. So, yeah, there, there's options. But if you, it's. It's an extraordinary place, Japan. I urge you to go if you've never been before. Mm, mm. On that note, we will leave it. Uh, Simon, and thank you very much for your time. Uh, we'll be back next Tuesday to look back at the Japanese Grand Prix. Hope you can join us then. Bye for now. 